The prophet Micah declares, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Welcome to worship on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. We are so glad that everyone is gathered in this digital space to praise God, to hear God's word, and to pray for the needs of the world. If you have a candle in your worship space, please take a moment to light it. Also note that we will offer up the prayers of the people later in this service, so please type your prayer uh, requests into the Facebook feed. The question of the day today is uh, simply a confession, and we will do that together during the sermon. But if you would like, you um, are encouraged to type into the Facebook feed the confession that is there, um, which is that we as the church, I want to get the wording exactly correct. We the church have gone our own way and hurt the people of God. Lord, have mercy. Today is the first day of our annual stewardship appeal. We gather around the theme celebrating generosity and at the beginning of the next few worship services we'll offer stories of generosity. But first um, I'll share just a um, brief gathering song for our stewardship appeal. Several years ago, during our annual Stewardship Appeal, people in the congregation hosted stewardship parties. I also hosted one here at the church in the North Room. One of our longtime members attended. Uh, a member who was in worship every Sunday, consistently checked in with people. She was a wonderful member of our community. During the party, I talked, among other things, about the financial needs of the congregation and I passed around the mission planning cards to each person at the party. This particular member is one who struggled financially. When this dearly loved member of our congregation received her card, she clearly didn't know how to respond. The card provided a place for people to write in how much they would give per week or per month or per year. As she looked at her card discerning, I could tell she didn't have any money to give, not just on that day, but over the course of the year. Um, and because I knew her well, I knew that she really didn't, which was okay, which was totally fine. Slowly, she dug into her purse and handed me a $1 bill. Here, she said, this is for the church. And then a few Sundays later, she showed up at the fellowship time just prior to the Christmas program with a Ziploc bag of homemade chocolate chip cookies to contribute to the fellowship feast, a gift of generosity. Generosity is not just about the amount, but the spirit of the gift. So today we celebrate her generosity and the generosity of God. Please join in singing our gathering hymn. I'm sorry. Let us first confess our sin and hear the promise of forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us and forms us, who redeems us and calls us, who unites us and sends us. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of overflowing grace, we come to you with honest and repentant hearts to confess our sin against you, our neighbors, your creation, and ourselves. Forgive us for indifference and judgment. Forgive us 
for passing by neighbors in need. Forgive us for dishonesty and broken promises. Forgive us for thoughtless participation in systems that bind and oppress. Renew us, Mother and God, in baptismal waters that we might serve and love you and your people. Amen. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, our sins are forgiven. We are free to serve and love. Thanks be to God. And now we sing together our gathering hymn, Thine the Amen. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Meet us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, Help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please join in singing the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people, I'm sorry, listened to another parable, Jesus said. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the te tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce of the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. An inside joke of mainline preachers is referring to the agony of year A of the lectionary. The lectionary, followed by many mainline Christian communities, is the set of biblical passages we read in scripture, read from scripture in worship. The revised common lectionary is three years long, year A, year B, and year C, with one gospel assigned to each year, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. In year A, we primarily read the gospel of Matthew, a gospel in which Jesus ends many teachings, parables, and allegories with the weeping and gnashing of teeth, with violence promised, with outer darkness and perplexing exclusion. When we preachers gather for Bible study each week during year A, we read the gospel passage and then sometimes proclaim the gospel of our Lord, and we laugh and sigh, and then sit in silence a while pondering what we will say about Matthew's Jesus. At this past week's Bible study, we preachers literally did this upon the reading of the allegory of the retaliatory landowner, the violent tenants, and the murdered slaves and son. In the allegory, the landowner entrusts his land to farmers called tenants. At harvest time, the landowner sends slaves to collect the rent in the form of produce. Instead of handing over the requisite produce, the tenants kill the slaves. Again, the landowner sends more slaves, and again, the tenants kill them. Finally, the landowner sends his son, thinking the tenants will honor the son, but they don't. They kill the son as well. Jesus then asks the chief priests and Pharisees who are listening, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They respond, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce of the harvest time. Jesus tells this allegory to the chief priests and Pharisees while sitting in the temple in Jerusalem, a place where they hold power and authority. Jesus directs the allegory to them so clearly that Matthew even tells us that the chief priests and Pharisees realize Jesus is speaking of them, tenants who dishonor the owner. Upon hearing his stinging allegory, the chief priests and Pharisees want to arrest Jesus, but they don't for fear of the crowd. The reason they want to arrest him is that Jesus' allegory is about 
religious leadership, about those who hold power in religious institutions, about those who steward the gifts of God but fail to bear the fruits of the kingdom. Jesus' allegory certainly makes me stop and think. Here I am, one given authority to forgive sin on behalf of God, one given authority to speak God's word, one given authority to administer the holiest of mysteries in bread and wine. I am a religious leader, like the chief priests and Pharisees. And indeed, God has called many of us within the congregation to positions of leadership. This allegory is for us. It reveals what can go wrong when we forget that we are stewards and not owners. When we forget that any authority or power we exercise was given to us by God and can be taken back by God. Jesus' allegory calls to mind the ways the church at large throughout the ages has contributed to violence and hatred against people of other religions, against women, against queer folks, against people of color, among others. I invite you to confess with me the sin of the church by repeating each phrase after me. We, the church, have gone our own way. We, the church, have gone our own way and hurt the people of God and hurt the people of God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Because we have gone our own way. Thanks be to God that the church and the mission of God are not ours to control. Just as the tenants do not own the land they work, we, the people of God, do not control the work of God, the mission of God, the blowing of the Holy Spirit. The church is God's. And when we fail to pray, seek, and follow God's will as our second biblical guiding principle states, we start to run off the rails. When we hold too tightly to our rigid ways of thinking and doing, opening ourselves to what God is doing becomes challenging. Fourteen years ago, I went to serve a congregation in a small town in Iowa. Fresh from seminary, where our professors taught us the correct ways of doing things, and fresh from a family system with many rules and boundaries, I came to the congregation with strong opinions about many things, but especially worship. In that congregation, confirmation students robed up every Sunday to light candles and serve communion. And as part of their duties as acolytes, they joined the procession at the beginning of the service. At my lowest point of my tight hold on correct worship procedure, I remember telling the senior pastor to instruct the acolyte to process in a certain way. She either forgot to instruct the confirmation student or instructed her incorrectly. Or maybe the confirmation student just went off on her own, who knows. Regardless, I was horrified when I watched the confirmation student enter the worship space with her torch lit, ready to light the altar candles and then walk the wrong way. A moment after my horror flashed across my face in plain view of the congregation, including the confirmation student, I realized my hold on correct worship procedure was too tight. Who cares? If a teenager in a small town in Iowa comes to church, serves as a worship leader, and then walks the wrong way. That the teenager came to church is a definite win. Her serving as a worship leader, just icing on the cake. While I learned many things from the senior pastor, my colleague Victoria, this was probably the most important. We do not have to hold on to our beliefs, our opinions, our correct procedures so tightly. 
we can hold our faith and the ministry of the church lightly in order to make space for the Spirit of God to guide us. As I look back on that Sunday morning procession, I imagine God celebrating the presence of a dearly loved young person in worship, thoroughly unperturbed by a wrong turn at the front of the worship space. Our tight hold on any belief or opinion or procedure can shut down new possibilities that God presents, new life that God provides, a new way of being church to which God might call us. It's God's church after all, not ours. Our beliefs and opinions and procedures aid us certainly in doing our very best, but when they impede the work of the Holy Spirit among us, a light hold on them allows us to let go when necessary. Jesus' allegory this morning doesn't contain much good news. The chief priests and Pharisees exercise a tight hold on their religion, and apparently it brings them to ruin. They don't understand that they are simply stewards of God's gifts, not owners. The sneaky good news in this cautionary tale is that despite whatever we tenants do to thwart the collection of the harvest, whatever we, the church, do to stop the mission of God, the land, the church, is not ours. This is God's church, and we are simply stewards with palms and harps open. Thanks be to God. Blessed by God's presence, we offer up the needs of our community, our world, and all God's creation. We stand in awe of your creation, O oh God. Give us discerning hearts as we steward this planet and its many resources, that life in its diversity might flourish, including human life. Put out wildfires and calm stormy winds, Nourish dry land with rain and bring equilibrium to flooded plains. Strengthen and inspire those who assist in disaster and protect your people. Give us your peace, O God, and strengthen us in hope. Relieve the suffering of those who 
who are ill or recovering from surgery, especially Jean, John, Latea, Clark, Steph, Judy, and Aberdeen. Comfort those who grieve, especially Cassandra, Margaret, and Steph. End the spread of COVID-19 and comfort those impacted, including President Trump and our First Lady. Give us your peace, O God, and strengthen us in hope. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your will, will be done, done on, on earth as in heaven. Give us, us today our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save, save us from the time of trial and, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also and with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. We do also give thanks to God for those who continue to contribute faithfully to grace. We are so grateful for your support that makes this ministry possible. And we also give thanks to Fran and Brandon for sharing a bit of music.
Let us pray. Spirit of God, grant us the virtue of elasticity. Make us pliable and playful. Stir our minds with your sacred spoon to awaken the fermentation of ideas. Help us, your church, embrace a spirit of adventure as we move into your future. Gift us with wide open hearts and minds, eager to embrace your leading, wherever, however, and whoever that includes. Amen. Just a few announcements this morning. First, we are really just grateful for everyone's presence. If you have never been to Grace before, we especially welcome you. And if you'd like to receive the weekly bulletin, please email me at pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at graceinthecity.com. We'll make sure to get you on that distribution list. Heads up, Grace will host a free flu vaccine clinic on Saturday, October 10th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., that is this coming Saturday. If you haven't yet received your flu vaccine, you can join us that day. Heads up, our new community building goal is to connect in three ways. Continue the weekly check-in chats with someone from the Grace community. Invite that person to join you for community building coffee on Sundays at 12.30. And come at least once on a Sunday morning to the drive through and walk up Holy Communion. One last reminder, please register to vote. If you have not done so, please register to vote. The deadline is tomorrow in the state of Arizona. To register, go to servicearizona.com and click on voter registration, very easy. Remember, we do continue to offer um, drive through and walk up Holy Communion on Sundays at nine to 9.30. And as ever, please join us for Grace Time Bible Study, Prayer Group, and Community Building Coffee. Check out the Glow Show on Apple Podcasts and Pentecost Pause on Facebook Live. Fly continues each Saturday at 4, Call each Sunday at 2, and Sunday Spirit each Sunday at 9.30. Remember, your bulletin has lots of good information in it, so please read it. Are there other announcements? All right. Wherever you are, please stand for the blessing. May the love of God overcome all hurt and anger. May the justice of God restore broken communities. May the grace of God establish all goodness. In the name of God, our creator, Jesus, our savior, and spirit, our fire. Amen. We sing together just a closer walk with thee.
are dismissed singing our gratitude. To God our thanks we give, to God our thanks we give, to God our thanks we give, our thanks to God we give, to God our thanks we give, to God our thanks we give, to God our thanks we give. in peace. Live with gratitude. Thanks be to God. God.